Welcome back to Drop Your Buffs. I'm Sean Ross, and today I am joined by a queen, an icon, a gay icon at that, a legend, <laughs> man eater, Manthe, survivor of the Australian Outback, survivor All Stars, and survivor Heroes vs. Villains superstar Jerry Manthe. Welcome back to the podcast, Jerry. Thanks for having me back. I, I forgot about the gay icon thing already. <laughs> the oh my biggest God, you compliment. can't forget about that. I've, that's the biggest compliment <laughs> I've ever gotten, honestly. I'm still blown away by that. I love it. <laughs> it was amazing after we published that interview that we got so many people contact us being like, how did Jerry not know she was a gay icon? Like she is <laughs> the moment. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I guess, you know, I left LA. I kind of lost touch with my whole community. <laughs> fair, fair. Well, Evan is away. He is frolicking around the south of France. So boohoo. Too bad for him. Wow. Um, so I needed to get some help here. So I activated my bat signal. I shined a blue bikini up in the sky. And <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, <laughs> like the superhero she is, <laughs> so kindly answered the call. <laughs> so oh, Jerry, it was my I'm pleasure. just like... I'm just thrilled to talk to you again. I mean, I think I said it last time, but, you know, you've been such a staple in my life and like pop culture in my life since I was 15 years old. So it's always an honor to talk to you. I have to ask you, uh, last time we talked was December of last year. How wow. is your 2022 going? Whew, it's been it's been a whirlwind on a lot of personal levels. Um, I think when I talked to you last, I had a a serious boyfriend. I've gone through mm -hmm. a breakup. I restarted my podcast. Um, yes. It's now been uh, renamed. You can catch me on Lessons from a Floating Unicorn with Jerry Manthe. Um, Love that. Yes. Um, and I've just been uh, private chefing and freelancing and living my best life. Honestly, I'm super happy right now. Napa's been treating me great. Uh, the weather's been amazing. Um, been you know spending time with my dog and just enjoying myself i really i'm in a really good place right now i feel very positive about the future and about my present and you know this whole season of survivor i've had so many people reach out to me and ask me to talk about it again and i you know anytime i feel like someone out there thinks i'm still relevant i feel very honored to be a part of that so I, we had so much fun in that last podcast, we talked for like two and a half hours. I was, when yeah, you asked me crazy. to do this again, I was like, oh, hell yeah, let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's not downplay your return to podcasting because Lessons from a Floating Unicorn, I have listened to all that new episodes. I love it. It's so great to hear from Jerry anytime. And <laughs> it's just you. It's just you on a hot mic and <laughs> you're sharing lessons from life and in the last episode you talked about your whole experience at burning man this year which was so fascinating did you say that it was your 20th time it, at burning man yes it was my 20th year at burning man I, it, wow it's, i know and i actually took the last five years off so you know it, it i've been going since 99 Do the math yeah yeah it's <laughs> unbelievable i yeah it was a really rough year um i get into great detail about why in my podcast but the weather, the heat, the dust storms, they were the worst I've ever seen. So I think Burning Man is definitely in a state of um, chaos. I think there's some shifting going on because a lot of people who were out there this year are just like, I'm not doing it again. It was that rough. Mm. So we'll see what happens. But it's always a magical experience for me. And I work really hard when I'm there. <laughs> I, I feel that. like I'm just so now kind people... of... Yeah, coming off the high. <laughs> <laughs> what can people expect from future episodes of your podcast? Uh, just me being me, honestly. I, I'm As I learn things in life and, and pick things up along the way, I just feel compelled now to share that with people. And uh, it, it has a way of... Okay, Sidney Pollack, a very well-known director, said a quote a long time ago, and I used to be really big into collecting quotes. And his quote was, sometimes the more specific you are, the more universal you become. And that always really resonated with me. But 
now I'm fully experiencing what that's like. So when I go through something that really causes a shift in my life and my mood and my behaviors and my insights in the world and and all the deep, meaningful things, um, when I share those things with people, it turns out that there's a lot of people going through the same exact thing. And so it helps us feel a little bit less alone and more connected with people outside our immediate circle. And that's really been... What I'm finding the most gratifying about the podcasting process is just the way it kind of brings people together. I've had some people contact me directly and share stories with me and just needing some comfort and some friendship and some camaraderie or advice. And that's been really great for me. So that's what I'm going to continue to do. I'm just, I'm living it organically. I'm not forcing myself to be on a set schedule with my podcast. I know that that's probably the podcast kiss of death. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Hey, I can tell you I'm, je- I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm not doing I it to make schedule. money. You know what I'm saying? Like if yeah. something comes out of it, cool, but I'm not doing it to get rich. So it just, as it happens organically for me, it's just been fun. And it's like I said, it's, it makes me feel closer to people as well. <laughs> Good, good. Okay, well, let's talk about Survivor a little bit. So we're four episodes into Survivor 43. I want to get the Jerry Manthe vibe check on what you're feeling about this new season. I love this new season. Like, I I really love it. And every time I've watched it since I was last on it, I've been like, I really, I really want to hate it. <laughs> but I can't. I can't because... Uh, This new, the new era of Survivor, I think, is so drastically different than it was in the past, Um, mainly because, and I've said this before, mainly because it's really humanizing the players. You get to hear their backstories, and you get to know their struggles and the things they've overcome in their life, and... Again, I think a lot like my podcast, it it helps bring people together who've had similar experiences. And so you feel emotionally attached to the players, I think, more than ever before. Uh, There's always somebody or several somebodies on these newer seasons that you can relate to directly because of something they've gone through in their life. And that's the part of the new era of Survivor I'm really enjoying, and I also wish that it would have been more that way when I was going through it. But um, this season, I think so far of the new era is my favorite. And I can't really figure out why exactly, but uh, this last episode last night, I think was one of my favorites. So I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah. It's really entertaining and also emotional. It's, it's literally, it gets me all excited, which 43 seasons of Survivor, that's that's a huge, a huge accomplishment to have this amount of people who are still watching it and very into it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the positivity you're bringing to this because uh, Evan and I are typically like very uh, curmudgeonly about <laughs> the new seasons because our hearts are just so in the old school era of the show. Like that's that's just what I love. And... Uh, you know, we find lots to complain about, but but I will say that last night's episode I really enjoyed. I thought it was fun. I thought that there was like some format mix ups that they did in terms of like the camp raid and and being able to see some of the tribes interact together in this pre merge portion, which typically we don't see. And then you know, even in the challenge where we had tribes helping each other in the yeah, challenge. that was crazy. Yeah. yeah, like what's that? What's the end game there? I don't. I don't um, think but, that was not a long term choice. That I don't. Yeah. I don't think that was a good idea. But you know, agree, agree. <laughs> I think there were a few bad moves made in last night's episode, but that I makes agree. it fun to watch. So, so hey, everybody who complains about how uh, negative me and Evan can be on the new seasons, <laughs> this is going to be a nice uh, break for you this week because uh, <laughs> we're both feeling pretty good about it right now. Oh, good. Well, so, I mean, I definitely, I always have my you know, critiques as well, but mm, overall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we can talk about Jeff later. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeffrey. Wow, Jeffrey. They let they let somebody call him Jeffrey. I think that was Dwight or Owen. I'm yes. not sure who that was that did that. But, you know, we talked to Courtney Yates, who famously called Jeff Jeffrey. 
Oh, she and did. And she said, oh, I love that. Yeah, she told us that people in later seasons would tell her, like, oh, you know, I tried to do that, and they shut it down. Like, he was <gasps> not having it. They wouldn't put it on air. They thought, like, he, you know, his God <laughs> complex maybe got a little too big. So I this is a big moment she... to have a Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I totally forgot that she did that all the time. It was hilarious. But it was, I don't know, it was really cute when it came from her. <laughs> She's <laughs> yeah. adorable. I'm trying to find this little cheat sheet you sent me uh, with everybody's names and faces because mm. I'm still having a hard time attaching it's names not to faces. Easy. It's not easy. It's just so early in the season. Like at this point, it's really, that's the hardest part, I think, to overcome once a new season starts is just trying to attach people's names and faces, especially yeah. when you're doing a podcast. I, I will it. say though, in this season, like so, some of the, some of the more modern sort of like in the thirties. And I don't know how much you've watched of like all of these seasons, but there was a time where it was like, well, you just wouldn't see people until they got voted out really. Oh. And I, I do <laughs> feel like in 43, they've done a pretty good job of, spreading the wealth in terms of screen time to like get to know some of these people you know some more than others I could do with a little less Cody but I feel Uh, like I kind of know who everybody is (laughs) Cody is very entertaining yeah Yeah, is he getting on your nerves uh yeah he's just like not the so Cody for me feels like the kind of character like um and I don't mean this as a slight to these people because I actually like them, but like a coach or like a Tyson, right? Who were on the same season. Um, but they're just a little larger than life and they're like a little bit, there's like a certain masculine, I don't want to say it's toxic. I don't think that it's necessarily a toxic masculinity, but there's like a, a masculine energy that's a little like, there's a lot of bravado And uh, that sort of turns me off because I'm drawn more to like, like give me an older woman on Survivor and I'm set. Like that's who I want to (laughs) watch. If Lindsay, who got voted out in this episode, had as much screen time as Cody, I think I'd be a lot happier. Really? That's interesting. Why Lindsay? Well, Lindsay's like, I, I mean, the thing with Lindsay is I don't know anything about her, right? And she went home last night. And all I know about her is that she's paranoid, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's what I got. That's what I'm left with. That's her legacy from Survivor. And I just feel like any person, it doesn't have to be a woman, but I'm more drawn to women being a gay man, that I feel like when somebody comes into the show with a little bit more life experience, a little bit like of a broader perspective, you know, they've gone through some things, then I'm willing to like hear what they say and take it in with a little bit more weight where Cody is, uh, you know, I'm an elevator salesman and I'm going to negotiate the hell out of this deal. (laughs) Like I'm like, Oh, whatever, whatever, you know? I mean, he's definitely, larger than life and very larger entertaining um <laughs> i i just i kept questioning the whole time like if he was a woman would he be able to get away with the same kind of behavior as he's getting away with you know lying about what he does targeting someone who actually has the same job that he does um going over to steal stuff from the camp and you know, blaming whatever on the rest of everybody else on his tribe that they all wanted the machete. Like all these things that when you're a man on Survivor tend to be very cunning and smart and, you know, cool, awesome moves. If you're a woman, you don't get that same respect. So that's the thing like goes through my mind a lot. I feel like we've really progressed far in the game of Survivor in terms of humanizing the players but at the same time i think we're still dealing with a little bit with the the imbalance of the male female and what they get away with so but yeah he's, i think he's that a really good i think a really good contrast to cody is like you look at ellie on the baka tribe right the yellow tribe <laughs> you have ellie who went through gabler's bag to you know check the I'm not even sure that it was Ellie who did that. I think Janine might have did that. It was but anyways, Janine. Ellie was like yeah. all involved, right? Ellie's kind of like we're seeing her as the, the the she thinks that she's the puppet master over on that tribe, but kind of everybody <laughs> is wise to her besides Janine. But 
I feel like the way that they're presenting Ellie is a little bit more um, villainous or like the it, I feel like the edit is trying to tell us like, oh, she's kind of being a doofus. She's kind of fumbling the ball here where I feel like Cody's doing the same thing. But through the edit and his like charisma and whatever, it's like, oh, we love this guy. Do you know what I mean? Like there is, and I can't put my finger on it, but there's something in the way that it's being presented that it's like, at the end of the day, these two are actually quite similar, but there's a disparity in the way they're being presented. Interesting. Yeah, I just, I thought, I'm curious about her because they keep showing her and every time they cut to her, her eyes are like really open wide, (laughs) almost like crazy psychotic. And I'm like, is that, I don't think she always does that but why do they keep cutting to her and she just looks so like maniacal and crazy <laughs> <laughs> but cody's always well, like likable and fun and he's yeah. like woohoo i'm cody <laughs> yeah. he just wants to jump off cliffs and and whatever oh my god when he did what he said that that day he's like ah you know I'm, today i'm just gonna go jump off of things and i'm thinking that's probably not smart to leave people alone for an entire day. <laughs> or to go jumping off unknown cliffs. Uh, that too. Yeah. You hurt yourself yeah, out there. You jumped off a cliff in season two. Oof. That was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. I have no desire to do that ever again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ever. No thanks. <laughs> well, let's talk about the Baca tribe a little bit because there is this wild thing going on with Gabler where... It seems like people want to ally themselves with him, or maybe they have to because he has this hidden immunity idol that's that's still good for their next vote. But he is just causing havoc at that camp. I mean, like putting the palm fronds on people while they're sleeping. Yeah, that's I can't annoying. like I have never seen something <laughs> this deranged <laughs> in many, many seasons. Um, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I had to live through Rupert chopping wood at four o'clock in the morning, keeping everyone up. Um, so, there, you know, sometimes people have no spatial awareness. And mm. it, that is actually something I have had to come to terms with in my real life. Like there's just some people who don't understand boundaries or, um, you know, how they might be doing something that's really annoying to someone else or disruptive. There's just certain people in the world that just don't have that spatial awareness. But like my thing with him is how many times is he going to refer to himself as 20 to 30 years older than everyone else? It's almost like in a crippling, a self crippling sort of way. Like I want him to change his dialogue. Like stop talking about yourself like that. Cause I know for myself, like I just turned 52 and I will say I hang out with people 20 to 30 years younger than me all the time. And nobody ever looks at me and says, oh, I can't believe she's here hanging out with us. Nobody's doing that. But when you do it to yourself, you're doing it to yourself. I think he's he's actually drawing a line in the sand. I'm over here. They're over there, which is, I think, to his detriment. I think at some point it's going to be a problem for him. Yeah, he's talking like he is ancient. Like he is talking like he has one foot in the grave. He is not old. He is he is literally not old. No, he's not. <laughs> like you think about the first season of Survivor. Sonia was 70 or something. Like Rudy was 72 years old playing this game. Was he? Gabler is like, yeah. Was Rudy 72 when I played with him in the All-Stars? I know, he was older than that when you played with him. <gasps> oh my gosh, yeah. I didn't even realize Wow. Yeah. yeah, I know. I don't know and why survivors turn 50-year-olds into these old people. I'm like, that is so not the case at all whatsoever. I know I can, I'm can. i watching this season just like kind of freaking out at how physical the challenges are. Like I, these are like some seriously physical challenges, which tells me they're eating. They're eating lots of food. And I know there's a lot of fruit on that island. <laughs> They're like, oh, well, all we've been eating all day is coconuts. I'm like, I would have killed for some coconuts. Well, they have so much food that even when, before Coco had to go to tribal council, Ryan was like, don't talk, like, I'm eating. Like, the strategy will start after I'm done eating. Let me finish my papaya. Where did this all come from? Yeah. (laughs) I said (laughs) the same thing. They're trees out of the ground. Yeah, I'm not going to talk strategy until I finish my papaya. (laughs) 
it's a different era for sure in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. But you, I'm... It's funny that you mentioned Rupert because going back to Gabler, I had this moment where I was like, I had a Rupert flashback because Ellie and Gabler had this little tiff over the fire and that Gabler had this specific way he wanted to make the fire, which wasn't working. And, and Ellie kind of like got frustrated with him. And this is after he tried to like make palm frond blankets for everybody uh, <laughs> against their will. And I had this little flashback to because Rupert was really obsessed with the fire, right? I remember this from Heroes versus Villains. I can't remember if this is the case in All-Stars, but I remember Sandra kind of losing it with Rupert and like do, even doing an impression like, oh, that's not how you do the fire. <laughs> do you recall this about Rupert? Like, is there fire drama? Um, I don't remember Rupert. I just remember him chopping wood at all hours of the night because he couldn't sleep. He was a smoker, like he smokes a lot of cigarettes and he was going through nicotine withdrawal for I think mm. the entire survivor experience and that was like his way of dealing with it I think was just chopping wood, but it's it's loud and disruptive when people are trying to sleep. That cuz that's the thing you don't sleep out there. So if you can squeak out just 10 minutes of sleep every half hour, you don't want to you don't want to ruin that for somebody. But yeah, the whole fire. That's happened a lot, actually, the fire thing, now that I think about it. Uh, Keith and I, in season two, had a whole fire thing because he kept trying to start it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it started with the fire because he was trying to start the fire in a place that wasn't where we actually wanted the fire. And he was like, well, when I get it going, I'll just move it. And I was like, well, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just put it where it belongs and start it there? <laughs> it's just... Yeah, it happens, right? And in this episode, I think there was a lot of finally people getting on each other's nerves, which mm. that is actually very normal out there. You're living with people you don't know. You have all these new roommates that drive you crazy. But if you're smart, you just let it go. And remember that you're not going to be with them forever. So just keep your mouth shut about things that annoy you if you can. <laughs> That's what I learned. It took me three seasons to figure that out. But I realized in the grand scheme of life, none of that stuff matters. So just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> yeah. I do feel like Ellie is, if anybody's getting the Jerry Manthe edit, which we don't really see anymore. But <laughs> if anybody's getting the Jerry Manthe edit, I think it's Ellie, right? I was huh. looking at the cast and I was like, well, who would fit into this? And I say that because Ellie is I, th I think that Ellie is, you know, like a, a, she's a smart person. Like, I think she knows what she wants uh, and she's bringing a lot of good experience to the game. But we're seeing a lot of people talk behind her back. They're kind of making her not a villain, but they're kind of setting her up for the audience to root against her. And, you know, she thinks she has some tight allies, but uh, they're kind of like plotting against her. So I just feel like I don't know if you sympathize with Ellie in this situation at all, but I'm just curious, like what your take is on that. And like, do you think that she can make it further than the next tribal council that they go to? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, it's funny you say that. I never I never really thought about that, but I could I could see her getting a little bit of the the villainous edit and again you know would she be getting that same treatment if she was a man because she's actually making some pretty smart moves um i think the whole bag situation was a really stupid thing for the two of them to do because uh gabler was so open with finding what he found and how it worked all they had to do is really ask him like hey like, did they really think he was that stupid? That that kind of mm. pissed me off. I'm like, you guys, you know, they were treating him like he was slow. And, you know, he's kind of, he, I need to baby him and crap like that, which I thought was a little, that I didn't, I didn't appreciate that. Because, it, you know, they're like, oh, he's older. <laughs> we need to baby him. <laughs> but going through his bag was like stupid to me. And what did they find S out? So... So what's your stance on the bag rummaging? Like, like, would, do you agree with that on principle? Uh, and I'm not trying to set you up because I know it wasn't you who went through Kel's bag. I know <laughs> it was, that was not Tina. me. And then she yes. tried to throw you under the bus with it. When she said, <laughs> what was that at the final tribal council? You said, do you regret anything in this game? And she went, yeah, I regret going through Kel's bag. 
That was a little dirty, I thought. Well, I mean, at least she admitted that it was her. And then still nobody heard that. They still blamed me for it years later. I was like, it was not me. It wasn't even my idea. I didn't want to go through his bag. I think that that's, that's a huge, um, I don't know. It's just overstepping some pretty big boundaries. Mm. And like, what did they think they were going to find in there? They already, he read the clue to them. They knew exactly what it said. Um, and I can't believe that they actually thought that he thought that it wasn't still valid. And that whole moment at the fire where uh, Ellie was trying to be, you know, manipulative or sneaky was just so silly. I was so glad she got busted for that. Where um, he was like, did she really think that I didn't know it was still good? <laughs> yeah, yeah, things like that kind of drive me a little bit nuts. But um, I, I, I don't know how she's going to fare. Honestly, my my favorite is Carla. Like I absolutely love yeah. her and I I want her to win. I she's my pick to win and I I think she could. I think she's getting like a really good showing and she's so smart. Like she was running circles around them at Coco before Tribal Council and when she made that bead idol like the, I thought she did a great job of playing to each individual players, like what was going to appeal to them. Like she went to Ryan and said, hey, I know your girlfriend likes turquoise things. So like, why don't I trade you this for this and trading her earrings and, and you know, like kind of pulling on what each person would respond to. I thought was so great. It, it really that episode and that whole moment is kind of what solidified it for me that she has a very, very good chance to win because she can read people. She pays attention obviously when they tell her things and she knows how to be manipulative without being uh disrespectful like that I, that was a really great moment because that i mean i love the fact that these immunity idols are coming with these like beware things that are so sketchy and like how some people are like how is how am i ever going to pull that off right like that's the difference between that kind of player and the person who's like, okay, let's do this. You know, those are the people I like to have in my life too. Like when there's a, a challenge of some sort and this happens at Burning Man all the time. Like you're like, okay, the stove isn't working. And then there's a person that's like, well, I guess we'll have to figure out how to do this without a stove. And then you have the other person who's like, oh, I'm going to figure out how to fix this. I got it. And then they go do it. There's two different kinds of people. And I think the ones who are proactive and are like, let's do this, are the ones who have a way better chance of winning. So Carla mm. all the way. <laughs> yeah. I do feel like, I mean, I love Carla. Carla is my pick to win. I do feel like the other contender is Jesse over on the Vessi tribe. Because he seems like very, like he's, he almost seems to be using Cody as a shield because he's so flashy. And I think that Jesse's a little bit smarter than Cody. So that when the time comes, you know, if somebody's coming for Jesse, they're going to hit Cody. And I like just the fact that, I mean, last episode that they voted NECA out, I feel like that was a great move for Jesse and a bad move for Cody because NECA was such a loyal ally to Cody, and he went and voted her out over Noel, who is not even very tight with him as, as far as we see. So I feel like Jesse's also, in the way that Carla's running circles around Coco, I feel like Jesse is running circles around Bessie. Really? Ah. Oh. Yeah, I, I couldn't understand when they voted out NECA either. And yeah, it, just the loyalty portion of that but I do understand the physical part because like I said these challenges are the worst I've ever seen like was it Janine that totally screwed up her chin yeah yeah <gasps> that moment in that challenge I about had a panic attack because can you imagine being trapped under that log in the sand I know that's what happened she got stuck under there and then she yeah. messed up her chin getting out for of sure there. I felt so bad for her but that challenge I was just like this is nuts like it, I understand why Gabler probably feels old when he's doing those challenges. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I keep saying, CBS, if you're going to do a Legends version, you better do it fast because we're all going to be senior citizens soon. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they can make maybe, maybe they can make the challenges, you know, something uh, you know, more puzzles? activities at the old folks' home. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, oh, come on, Jeff, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> Lawn bowling or something. Of course, he'll be out there going, all right, survivors, come on in. 
<laughs> Jeff has uh, Jeff's been going on a wild ride these days. It seems like, like even in this episode, like when he brought them all into the reward challenge, and he's taking attendance like it's preschool. You know, he's like saying everybody's name, and he's like he seems to be having more fun. I want to say, but it's almost coming off like it's uh, if you ex- try to explain to an alien what fun <laughs> is and then the alien tries to act fun <laughs> are you calling jeff an jeff. alien <laughs> oh man yeah i i will say i'm enjoying the fact that he i mean he he's definitely playing into this whole human aspect of the players mm. but this season he's started a little bit more to come out like his old self where he's giving people crap during the challenges like i have to say like i think that that is so entertaining and i kind of missed it the last couple of seasons where he's just like so and so over there struggling a little bit <laughs> yeah it's a little more a little more fun i think he's having with them yeah, I think that turned me off for a while because it just felt like he was like kind of picking on the people I liked, like usually the women, like especially the older women. Yeah. Um, but if if he's going to start sort of uh, divvying that out more fairly, then I'm all for that. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely did pick yeah. on the older women. I do remember that. I mean, yeah, some of these challenges are just nuts. I, and I love that there's so many new things. They're doing fun, new, interesting challenges. <laughs> yeah, I have to say I've never seen the walking on the blocks before. It's interesting. Yeah. I don't know if like I don't know if it's they've perfected it yet, but I was I'm glad they're trying something new. Yeah. yeah. And Jeff was there. Jeff was there egging them on like uh the the floor is lava, the floor is lava. <laughs> so <laughs> glad he's having fun. <laughs> but he's Much also like making up brand new rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's also making up brand new rules because when eventually Vessi wins the reward, which is supposed to be 10 fish. fresh fish and the ability to raid another camp, they say, well, Jeff, don't you remember you took our flint away? What are we going to cook the fish with? And he's like, well, as you know, you can <laughs> always trade your reward for a previous reward. What? Yeah. Yeah, that was as you know out of left field. <laughs> it was very matter of fact, and I I was with you on that. I was just like, "What is he saying right now?" That has definitely never been in the rule book before, ever. Yeah, it's like you know what, Jeff? I I don't want the Doritos. Like, take me to the Great Barrier Reef. Like, that's what <laughs> I want. I w- I don't want the family visit. Can I have the car? Like, <laughs> <laughs> since when? <laughs> I know. I wonder to what extent you can actually go back and and negotiate for a different reward. That's a very that's a very good question. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll find out this well, season. Yeah, I mean they don't have like they don't quite have the same. I feel like the rewards have gotten a little bit mm, cheaper. Do you know what I mean? Like a bowl of fruit. Oh yeah, I I think they're. I really... mean, I guess you you and did it looks rotten to in me. the early seasons. Sorry, what was that? It looked like rotten fruit. If you look at the close up, there, it's like black marks all over it and it looks bruised. It doesn't even oh, look appealing. That. Yeah, that's what I looked right at. It. I was like, ew, gross. But I know where, what you're, you you you're going to say. You all had you had some you had some really good rewards, right? Like the, your Great Barrier Reef yeah. date. The helicopter. Colby, like, yeah. hello. Anybody would want to go on that. And then. <laughs> Uh, but then other ones were like, your family visit was it like, oh, you weren't there, I don't think, for that family challenge where you chat with. The... In Australia? No. Yeah. Were you at the. F- no. Yeah. So that was the Internet Cafe and it was like ch- a, a chat room. I mean, ultimately, like that was, uh, uh, I think, or was that that wasn't Colby won the car and then his mom was there. Right. Yeah. And he but got there his conjugal like family... visit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> I was like, I don't think he knows what that word means. <laughs> somebody, yeah, somebody call him. <laughs> I was like, that's awkward. No, but I mean, it was like we got uh, Doritos and Mountain Dew. I'll never yeah, forget that challenge. that's not a good one. They baited us with the idea, like, if you win this, you get a picnic lunch. So we were fantasizing about 
ham and cheese sandwiches and turkey and Swiss sandwiches on rye, like all these like great sandwich options. And we got there and it was Mountain Dew and Doritos. And at that point, I didn't even care. I was like, I don't even care if we win this one. <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, I, I think they're just really not. trying to enforce this idea that they've got it so much harder now. But I just, every time I see a shot of them eating copious amounts of fruit, you know, they have almonds, they have papayas, they've got coconuts. Uh, I mean, those are all things that you can 100% live on just fine. I don't see anybody complaining about being hungry or losing weight at all. And who needs a bowl of fruit when the island apparently is full of all these things? I don't. Is that even a necessary reward? <laughs> I don't know. It's very strange. That that part is kind of a... I would like someone to debunk that that's actually been on the show. I'd be very curious what they say. Yeah, totally. Like how much fruit is or, or, actually available? <laughs> I also wonder whether it's different for the different beaches because Coco just seems to have all this fruit. But why is Vessi struggling? Or do they just not know what to look for? Because... How can Coco be eating like kings and queens and the others are just starving away and like trying to catch fish over at Baca and we haven't seen anything really go well with that. But um, <laughs> it's it, there is I think it's possible that, you know, the different locations have different trees and vegetation and it's very that. possible. I mean, it also could be that Coco hasn't really had to play the game as hard because they haven't been to tribal council until just recently. Like they, they had the time to go look for fruit and everyone mm. else was scrambling to figure out who they're going to vote out. Good point. I don't know. They had nothing but time. Yeah. They had lots of, you know, downtime, like kumbaya moments. I love how many of the tribes are all referring to their getting along as kumbaya moments. <laughs> <laughs> That's we'll see how long that lasts. Name. Take a shot every time kumbaya is said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to get real dirty soon after this episode. This I, There was definitely a shift with um, not so much kumbaya and more like, oh, we we got to start playing this game. And then I still just I cannot get over the fact that Vessi was was it? Yeah. Vessi was helping um, Baka win yeah. that challenge. Like, yeah. blatantly. It was. Yeah. I'm like, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? I kept saying that over and over again. Like, oh, no. Oh, no, this is not. It's not good. I, I don't. Yeah, I, don't I really don't that. know what the end game is. I mean, obviously, they were like focused on weakening Coco because obviously they raid, raided their camp. But we'll talk about that. But do we have to take that one step further to say also let's get one of them kicked out? Like what, what kind of, it's not like they have relationships over at Baca that they, they don't know what's going on at Baca. If they want to hitch their <laughs> cart to Baca's horse, I think that's a big mistake because they have no idea what's going on with Gabler and the palm fronds at night. <laughs> like that's what they want to deal with moving forward. That tribe is, is a disaster in terms of like what the dynamics are there. Yeah, it's pretty messy. <laughs> And also there's something to be said, I, uh, I, I think I saw Stephen Fishback tweet this, that keeping a tribe intact actually can be more beneficial for you down the line because if you prevent them from going to tribal council and dealing with their issues, then they'll self-destruct at the merge. So for example, like let's say, let's say Coco went all the way to the merge without voting somebody out. Lindsay could have had her breakdown at the merge. And then all of a sudden Coco's a disaster and they can't get an alliance together and the other two can come together and just pick them off. Um, <laughs> and I think that that's historically what has happened. I think one of the only times it hasn't happened that way is when Erica won in 41 because her tribe never went to tribal pre-merge. But I'm getting too deep in the weeds here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I it's, thought that was an interesting point from Steven. Yeah. I mean, I, I did start counting heads. I was like, okay, so if Vessi and Baca were to be together, they would have bigger numbers than uh, Coco. So maybe mm -hmm. they were thinking about that. I, I don't know. I, the fact that they blatantly helped someone win a challenge, I think, was just a very strange choice. I wonder if that was predetermined in some way or if it just happened organically. Like, I couldn't really tell. 
But uh, yeah, because it wasn't even that it was Cody. I could understand if it was Cody who initiated all that, but I rewatched the episode and it was Noel that initiated it. Noel yeah. was calling out to Janine, I think, like how to put the puzzle together. And I thought Noel has been playing a pretty smart and quiet game. And so for her to come out and help a tribe so blatantly, I thought was kind of surprising. I wonder if it was her way of letting them know that she's kind of a free agent. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Because yeah. she's kind of on the outs with that tribe, even though they voted out NECA instead of her. And yeah. I, th- I think that's going to bite them in the butt. I don't know what Cody, I think that was Cody's misstep, to be honest. That yeah. and the whole, you know, saying that they wanted their machete and that the rest of the tribe was, it was their idea. That's the, they're going to, if they want to, they can easily find that out if that's true. But I'm, I'm just, I don't know this, this season, the, uh, the first episode when both him and Sammy lied to people, I was like, I just don't know if that's ever a really good idea, to be honest. Like, especially with Sammy, like a, he's 19 saying he's 22, which by the way, Sammy, that's not that big of a difference. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> Let's Literally, who cares? The only person who thinks that there's a difference between 19 and 22 is a 19-year-old. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but he's been playing a good game, too, and he's been pretty smart. Um, and he's been making some really good moves just to to prove that he's worth keeping around. Um, I, I think I think he's kind of an interesting person to keep an eye on as well. But yeah, yeah, the whole I agree. 22 lie, I, I just chuckled to myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've got we've got a 19-year-old, 22-year-old, and we've got a geriatric 52-year-old on that ride. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I guess, you know, Gabler's on his feet all day long performing very stressful heart valve surgeries. I understand he probably has dealt with a lot of stress in his life so i don't want to i don't want to you know give him too much crap but at the same time like as someone who's over 50 now i'm just like stop with the age the ageism we're trying to get rid of the ageism in survivor and and he didn't he make a statement he said there's only been one winner over the age of 50 is that true that is true that i actually i thought when he said that, I was like, there's no way. He's got his facts wrong. I'm, yeah. the, I'm the Survivor fact checker. I'm going to find this out. There is only one, and it's Bob Crowley from Survivor Gabon. And he was quite a bit older than 50, wasn't he? No. He was like 57. He was wow. a very old 57. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's so cute with his little bow tie. I know. Very sweet man. <laughs> yeah. there's. It's, you know, if you look back at some of the the older survivors there's some really great characters that have come out of this show like people oh yeah really good people with very distinct personalities and just the way they look right just i i think that's one of the things i love it about looking backwards in time it's just how diverse yeah. people uh, well yeah they they're actually more diverse now which is exciting let me just tell you as someone who played the game three times we even said it as people playing, we were like, why are there so many white people here? <laughs> like, where's the diversity? Where's the, it, it's been missing for a long time. And I'm so excited now to see all these different people from different backgrounds. And I, I love it. I think it's the smartest thing the that survivor could have ever done. Cause again, you know, you're, you're getting a bigger audience and you're getting more people involved in watching because they feel like there's someone they can connect with. I think that's yeah. been missing for a very, very long time. And I'm just and, and I think excited. The stories that they bring are interesting, right? Like we've seen the same sort of like 22-year-old model actors come in and out of Survivor with not a lot of personality, <laughs> some of them. And we've heard those stories. And so to get diverse cast brings us diverse stories, diverse perspectives. I think sometimes people play differently because of where they're from and who they are. And so I think that that's the, really the big benefit that 41, 42, and 43 has given us is that we're seeing a different way Maybe of playing the game, but certainly a different perspective on the game from some of these people that we haven't seen before. And that's how you're going to keep it fresh. 
Yeah, 100 percent. I think that's that's why we're all so engaged again is because there's just there's more diversity all around stories, everything like yeah. uh, I mean, I I remember there was a whole genre of survivor seasons that came out. It was like everyone was just drop dead gorgeous. And I understand they look great in a swimsuit. I get it. But at some point you want more than that. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. That was a, yeah. that was a dark time in my survivor watching history. Boring. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> a real struggle to. Get I need through. someone interesting in all kinds of levels, not just the way they look. <laughs> yeah. Now, having said that, I don't mind a little eye candy. But <laughs> who's your you know, eye candy one or this two season? Per season? Who's your eye that candy? That is a great question because um, <laughs> I like. I almost feel like I have to say Cody, but I don't like Cody. What about Ryan? So, but like, oh, of course it's Ryan. What was I thinking? It's Ryan. He's hot. He's oh my so god! Hot. Yes, Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. We had this. We had a. Me and Evan had a full discussion about this. Oh, you after did. Episode one, and I and I blanked it out from my. <laughs> Ryan is hot. He's so hot. Ryan is hot, and he's so strong. Yeah, I just feel like we're not seeing much of Ryan anymore. He was kind of like prevalent in the first episode. We got his great backstory and how he has cerebral palsy and he's and he was working with geo and like they have this unlikely friendship but he's disappeared a little bit um and you know all we got from his this episode was don't talk to me till i'm done my paya <laughs> and isn't he the one but who called Ryan jeff jeffrey hot. he's the one who called jeff jeffrey i think wasn't it i'm not a hundred percent sure if it is then more points to <laughs> yeah he i mean that <laughs> challenge where they had to make the different shapes out of the blocks and you could tell yeah. how heavy they were. And when they had to carry those oh, blocks up the, yeah. the rope thing. I mean, I was just like watching this going, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get hurt. And there was Ryan like carrying that huge block by himself. Like the incredible Hulk. And then he gets to the top and he just throws it over. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I got He's really hot. And he seems like such a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, and he's nice. And he's nice. Yeah. Yeah. When are you going to interview yeah, him? I like, I like Ryan. Oh, we'll, we'll see. I think, I think you should. <laughs> we'll have to talk to CBS. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, CBS. <laughs> I want to get in on that interview, yeah. too. He's, he's a hottie. <laughs> Yeah, he but, is, but Cody. Is. Well, he's like, careful. Careful. He's collecting those turquoise beads for his girlfriend. Oh, that's right. Well, I, you know. I could still look. <laughs> but there is something about Cody, though. I I kind of really like his mohawk haircut. And he's he's the kind of guy that you would probably want to hang out with at a party. But I would not want to play Survivor with him. I, it's the yeah. whole lying thing, the whole salesman thing. Like, the fact that he brought that up and then I realized, wait. Wait, it just said in the bottom that he's a salesman. So what's happening? Oh, my gosh. He's lying and he's manipulating and he's putting a target on another salesperson's back. <laughs> like, and he's adopting the uh, Hawaii accent. Oh, um, mahalo. <laughs> as, like, as Carla pointed out, as Carla <laughs> pointed out, bro, you're from Idaho. He's actually from <laughs> Iowa, I think. But like, whatever. It's all the same, right? Uh, <laughs> I love but I her. love Carla for that. I love her for that. I love her so much. I swear. I, yeah. She reminds me of a good friend of mine out here in Napa Valley. And I think when I first saw her, I thought for a second it was my friend. I was like, no, nah, because her name's not Carla. <laughs> but I was like, <laughs> um, wow. And then I, her story, like all of it. Just, I don't know. I just really like her. And at first I thought the nose ring, I was like, girl you better take that thing out it's gonna get infected like that's the first thing out of my mind is like dirt is gonna collect <laughs> in your nose ring get it out <laughs> so i'm a little concerned about her health and safety i hope she took good care of it <laughs> but she's a badass well I, I hope she's i hope she's winning a million dollars so maybe she'll be able to pay any medical bills that she has for the the septum piercing right yeah, I, I just kept thinking about all the things that was going to get caught on. <laughs> oh, yeah. And in challenges and stuff, nets. Yeah. And I just don't think wood. it's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. 
Wow. If, if, if Carla ends up getting medevaced because of her septum piercing, Jerry, like... I'm going to lose it. We got to yeah. give you an award. Yeah, I'm going to lose... No, I want. I don't want that award. I want her to win. <laughs> no, for, for recognizing that. Oh. <laughs> uh, oh, for my perceptive uh, being. For, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, your powers of perception. Okay, let's talk about the camp raid. I feel like um, I'm, I'm taking us off track here. But... So so Cody goes on this camp right and there's this big discussion like do we take the machete or do we take fishing supplies like do we want to cripple them or do we want to help ourselves what would you do in this situation I would definitely not do what he did that's all I know Yeah um I did find it very interesting because again the sales person in him is exactly what he was using all the tools that you learn when you're a salesman ask for way more than you actually want knowing that you will then get more than you actually need it's a Mm. interesting approach which may work very well in the business world but on survivor i think it's i think it's kind of stupid i mean to actually threaten to take the machete was i mean that's that's like taking away someone's life out there it's like it's like Rupert taking people's shoes. It's like Russell stealing people's socks. Those are things mm. that you need in order to be comfortable and to get by on a daily basis. So that was I was a little rough, I think. Um, and then the fact that Carla went called it out at the end, like I think we just got swindled by Cody. <laughs> And she, again, is a very perceptive person, and I think that's going to end up biting him in the ass. I really do. Um, I, yeah. I wouldn't have, I would have gone to the other tribe. They had more stuff. Then you could take yeah. half of the fishing stuff and leave them the other half. You could take some of their food knowing they had plenty more left. Like, I wouldn't have gone, I wouldn't have gone that route at all. Totally different tribe, totally different ask, 100%. Because you don't, I mean, this is actually your opportunity to bond some or make some bonds with people that you're eventually going to merge with. So why, why burn the bridge before the bridge gets built? It didn't make any and sense. And in retrospect, in retrospect, Vessi helped Baca at the immunity challenge. So they, they obviously have had some conversations about like, okay, we want to work with Baca. Or we really don't like Coco. They're winning too much. Maybe their egos are getting big. I don't know what their issue is, but if, they already have it in their head that they they want to help Baca. Then go to Baca and use this as an opportunity to to make some cross tribal alliance and like build a relationship and say like you know what we'll just take like one of your fishing spears. We have to take something. Like why don't we help each other out? We'll repay you at the merge or something like that. But they used this as an opportunity to make enemies. Yeah, and then they solidified that at the challenge. It just yeah. doesn't make any sense to me so i we're gonna i mean we'll eventually see how this plays out but i just don't think it's gonna work in their favor yeah i thought it was interesting too that we didn't get anything about the beware advantages because of course cody has his idol that he made from the beads and carla over on the coco tribe has her idol that she made from the beads i'm kind of surprised we didn't get anything about Cody going over there and being like I want to see if the beads are still on the bags or you know he could have taken this as an opportunity to do a little digging and we didn't see him do that it's not to say he didn't do it but we didn't see him do that and I think that that may be another wasted opportunity for him in this whole thing I thought about that too I was like you can go to someone else's camp and you can take whatever you want so what would be stopping someone from getting someone else's immunity idol like yeah i think there is a rule with the idols that you can't like they can't be stolen that i've heard there? before but but what are they going to do step in and they, they would have to tell you and then they'd blow up who had what it could get messy <laughs> could get yeah. messy and we don't really know what the rules are anymore because apparently yeah, you can trade true. in your hey, reward <laughs> they're making them up as they go <laughs> do you do you think that Okay, let's put you on Survivor 44. Okay. Uh, So this is separate of the legend season that we've already casted you on. So you're on Survivor 44. Somebody asks you for, hey, that's a nice little trinket on your bag. Can I have that? Would you give it up? 
Ugh. If you didn't know, if you didn't know this, if you hadn't seen 43, right, you haven't seen that people are collecting beads for an idol. Let's just say you have something on you that Survivor gave you. Would you willingly give it up? I would make them trade it for something I wanted. Mm. Yeah, I don't think something I would just, good. especially, I mean, yeah, and now we know that there's potential for it being something more than just a trinket, but um, I don't know. We used to keep a lot of the challenge things. Like, you really? know, when, when they would put in our, they don't even do tree mail anymore. I just realized tree mail was they amazing. They do. They don't show it. Do you <gasps> know how I know? What? Do you know how I know? I have no idea. It's that my friend Ricard gave me this piece of tree mail from 41. <laughs> oh my gosh. No way. Yeah, so they, they do do tree mail. They, why aren't they showing it? I love tree mail. That was like. I know. Me too. It was the best thing ever. It makes you feel like you're getting real mail. <laughs> 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 wow. I'm wonder- so I wonder if they're, you think they're still doing it now? They're still doing it. And and so this is what I've heard. Like, this is the speculation that's out there from former players is that not only do they give them tree mail, but I, I think like in those like season one, season two, in those very early seasons, I think it was just some paper, right? In a, whatever the receptacle was that the tree mail came in. Now they give them tree mail that comes in an envelope and it's decorated with beads and it's got all this stuff i my theory is that they are encouraging the the making of fake idols so they gave Uh. them they give them these ornate tree mails that they can like take apart if they wanted to so that's more (laughs) trinkets that they could either like take home with them as a souvenir or i think they're being more so encouraged to create fake idols with Hmm. that's an interesting theory that's my guess i mean we used to get so tree mail that yeah what did you take um you know, whenever, whenever, sometimes when there was a challenge, they would send pieces of that challenge ahead so that we'd have time to practice. Like there was, right. do you remember the House of Cards? I, that's the only yeah. individual immunity I ever won was the House of Cards thing. Yeah. So they sent us little, uh, pl- little, little wooden pieces that were used for the House of Cards to practice st- stacking them. And so I took, I took some of those. Um, I've got some really good pieces actually in a box hidden away somewhere <laughs> you have to do a show and tell one day i think i'm gonna have to dig them out yeah and there there's even um in the all-stars something that they never showed on that season which i thought was so cool we got to write a letter to someone on another tribe anyone you could pick anyone and they gave us a piece of paper and a pencil to write a note and i wrote a note to amber and I was telling her that I needed to get out of my tribe. I was like, I can't wait till the merge. I can't wait to, you know, hang out with you. Um, and her and Rob collectively wrote me a letter, which is really ironic with the way everything ended up happening that season. But I still have those letters. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Then they're they're on. Uh, I need to get them in something so they stop degrading. But they're just like slowly you know fading i wrote a shopping list one time with the home depot box we had uh pencils in there (laughs) and i took a tree mail and i sat down and i wrote a grocery list of everything i was going to buy at the grocery store when i got out of there (laughs) i had all these plans make it rice krispie treats and like brownies and cakes and like all this kind of stuff and i still have that too that grocery list yeah we got some good stuff back then (laughs) <laughs> these days you could probably hand that grocery list to jeff and say jeff this is what i want the reward to be <laughs> and you'll say okay as always you can always tell me what you want <laughs> yeah as always <laughs> <laughs> that was so bizarre that was okay. just i kept thinking wow yeah. yeah we need to see the rules i think there's got to be them yeah. listed somewhere <laughs> they're up in jeff's noggin i think <laughs> Okay, so they do the uh, immunity challenge. We've already talked a lot about this, right? So Vessi ends up uh, helping uh, Baka win, and they both win. Coco's finally going to tribal council for the first time. Uh, I think we've discussed that. So let's talk about the pre-tribal strategy that happened at Coco because it opened with Ryan and Gio, who were working together, talking about uh, getting Cassidy out. So it was really like 
pitched as this like Geo versus Cassidy. That's what we thought we were going to get. And we see that people are a little bit annoyed with Geo because maybe he feels like he's in, too in control of the game or he, or he thinks he thinks he is, uh, which is always... And Ca- Cassidy even calls him sassy, which... Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. That's, I that's think he was. I think he was being sassy. silly. He was being silly. Yeah. You can't be that cocky yeah. on Survivor. Come on, you just can't. Yeah. It's the kiss of death. <laughs> and and I wasn't really seeing the argument for getting Cassidy out. It was just that just that Geo didn't like her. Yeah. I think. And well, I knew she wasn't going anywhere because Jeff didn't ask her a single question that entire tribal is like she's <laughs> she's fine <laughs> she's fine yeah yeah uh, but, but then out of nowhere of course Lindsay starts to self-destruct and it's interesting because they haven't gone to tribal yet so we haven't really seen it's not really until a tribe first goes to tribal that they know and we know where the actual lines are in the alliances and it seemed like uh uh Carla was really in the middle of two potential alliances. And so we did see that Cassidy, Lindsay, James, and Carla were coming together to talk about the vote. And they were, uh, they told us even in confessional, it's going to be Geo tonight. And nobody has to worry. So it seems like Carla made up her mind. So she's, she's kind of like, was at one time more in the camp of, you know what, I'm not going to align myself with Geo. I'm not going to align myself with Ryan, who are this tight two, which is interesting because. Carla and Gio had that like nice moment in the first episode, the bonding over their life experience. So uh, I guess Gio really is controlling a little bit at camp if Carla's not wanting to hang out with them anymore. Yeah, I thought for sure after they had that moment that the two of them were going to end up working together, um, despite the fact that she had already basically aligned herself with other people. But yeah, he, I think this episode, he really screwed the pooch. He did so many things you should never do or say things you should never say on Survivor. And you should never, ever get cocky. Like, I don't care what position you think you're in. It's just not smart because it it rubs everybody the wrong way. It just does. And Mm -hmm. you just, you never know. You don't know who you can trust. Although him and Ryan are, are super tight, obviously. But, I mean, even still, like, everybody's after they're taking care of themselves at the end of the day. It's Survivor. And so I think yeah. he, this episode, he really showed and said way too much. Um, it's it's going to cause a big problem for him. I think this, I think and he might he be the luck- next, he, he might be the next to go if yeah. they, if they lose. Yeah. I think so. And he got lucky. He got lucky that Lindsay. Self-destructed. I get the best of her. Yeah. And I still kind of can't believe that they did that either. Like I would have thought they would have still gone for geo and just kept Lindsay around for another vote because it seems a little risky just to get rid of her just because she's being paranoid if anything this is a good chance to prove to her that she doesn't need to be paranoid and then she might have been even more loyal to them but um i mean she must have really blew up camp <laughs> like worse than what we saw <laughs> because i could i just couldn't believe they got rid of her i was like ooh. I don't know. It's kind of like the neck of yeah. vote. Same thing. The, I was like, yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily the best long-term choice, but okay. Yeah, it's interesting. Like when I think about it as you're describing it, it's really a kind of an old school way of playing the game where I think in more recent seasons, like, okay, like, yeah, this person's driving me nuts. She's totally paranoid. This is like a lot to deal with, but you know, we'll vote, we'll show her that there was no need to be paranoid. And then we've got a loyal ally moving forward. But instead, they're like, I can't live with this. And and that is like a very old school approach to the game. We're like, I, I cannot live with this person. I need to get rid of them. I'll deal with the fallout later. I'll figure out what I'm doing after that. But I'm trying to make my life comfortable right now. Yeah. I mean, she must have been way worse than we saw. That's the only thing I could think <laughs> of was like, things just got so crazy and out of hand. Like a They did show some of it, and she definitely did go way overboard. I think she was almost getting a little bit aggressive, it seemed. Mm. So, I don't know. That'd be a good question to ask if we ever get to talk to Carla. Yeah. (laughs) So, let's talk about the Tribal Council really quickly. They do uh, go to Tribal, and they talk about uh, uh, how they were discussing the vote right up until 
the sun went down and they had to go to tribal council. I thought that was an interesting comment to include because I imagine that happens all the time. But was it really just trying to keep a lid on Lindsay and her paranoia? I'm wondering from you, from somebody who's been to many tribal councils, were you ever in a situation where you felt like that when you were going to tribal, you were like, the discussion hasn't finished yet? Oh, 100%. Do you wish you had more time? Yeah, no, that happened more often than not when I was playing because we weren't allowed to talk at tribal council like they do now, where Mm. they get up and walk around and they're like standing and having conversations. That was not allowed when I played before. So if you didn't finish your conversation and make up your mind before you got there, you know, there's a lot of eye signals and like, you know, (laughs) with anything we could do, you know, miming. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that's very common. But I did notice this season, I haven't seen that talking so much at Tribal Council. And I hope that it stays that way because I absolutely hate it. It's one of my least hate favorite it. things that has happened over the years is the ability for it to be okay to like, hey, let's go stand over in the corner over here at Tribal Council and discuss things. Like, I don't like that because we don't get to see yeah. it. We don't get to hear it as an audience. And I don't think that it's it's not interesting it's just aggravating no no the show treats it as something very exciting and something we should be very like titillated by but we're just watching people whisper yeah that's not fun not exciting and we don't know what they're saying yeah yeah (laughs) so of course Lindsay does get the majority of votes she votes for geo so she's you know along with the plan um, I thought it was interesting, though, Gio voted for Cassidy. So Gio was either, I, I've been thinking about this, Gio was either left out of the vote entirely or Gio cast like a contingency vote in case Lindsay used her shot in the dark. I wonder. Yeah. I'm because like... we haven't, although they're still doing the shot in the dark, we haven't really seen a lot of talk about it and we haven't seen anybody do it. Whereas in 42, people were playing it left, right and center. Like they were rolling the die every time they every chance they got yeah i didn't even realize that it was a part of this season because it was never discussed at the beginning at any point so i'm i I was surprised to hear that it was still part of the game (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) yeah that's something i could lose to be honest with you um i so ultimately i think Lindsay went home as we said because the the paranoia got the best of her she sunk her own game I have to ask when it comes to paranoia, it reminded me a little bit of in Heroes vs. Villains when Russell started to rile up Parvati and Danielle, right? And started to pit them against each other. And they kind of like, they caught on to it, if memory serves me correct. They, they like shared stories and they're like, okay, Russell's being a crazy person as he's <laughs> wont to do. And then, and then, you know, he goes they go to you all go to tribal council and at tribal he just like lays into her so much that uh her paranoia does she does have that like little breakdown at tribal and 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 she ends up saying more than she meant to say saying that she was closer to poverty um, yeah than she was to, to russell or you um and it ends up getting her voted out so like is that did you feel like there's like a parallel in that situation or were there any other times that you've seen the paranoia really sink someone's game well, I will say this, that whole moment in Heroes and Villains was how I stuck around longer because I saw the crack and I saw Parvati and Danielle and Russell become like literally on opposite sides of each other. And that was the alliance that I was trying to figure out how to get higher up in the ranks with. And so that was my moment to get Danielle out of there. I, I, just, I That was like... That was nuts, but that was actually why I ended up sticking around until the very end because of that moment. But I I couldn't even believe myself that night. I was like, wow, Danielle just like lost it. She just completely lost it and showed her cards. Um, And I know she's she was very upset about that in the the finale. I think more so at herself really than anybody else. But Mm. it happens. You know, some people just kind of lose it and. And Jeff, well, Jeff is really good at asking questions that make people show their cards. Um, he used to do that way more than he has in the last couple seasons. Like he had ways mm. of asking questions where people would just respond, you know, without thinking and then just show all their cards. 
I, he was so good at that. <laughs> but I, yeah, that's one thing you don't ever want to do, right? You don't want to be paranoid openly. Like we're, we're all paranoid constantly. Like every time somebody walks away and leaves you sitting at the, the fire, uh, you're like, what are, wait, why wasn't I asked to go with them? What are they talking about? Like it's one of the most exhausting things about that game. It's not just the physical challenges and whatnot. It's also the the actual mental distress that you feel every time somebody leaves the group and you're not with them so Mm. and you'd be surprised how exhausted that can actually make you physically as well yeah Yeah. my dog is snoring in the background (laughs) (laughs) she's in every single one of my podcasts (laughs) Um, do you have a few minutes? We have we have some listener questions. Do you have oh a my few gosh! To take some questions. <gasps> yes, I love Amazing. listener questions. Um, <laughs> only one of them is is a uh, okay. Well, a lot of them are written, so I, I have, <laughs> but I have one voicemail. Okay, so uh, let's just walk through these a little bit. So Matthew asks, if you were cast in the new era of Survivor, what would your backstory package look like? Wow. I'm not asking you to unload your trauma, but. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I've actually lived a very blessed life. I mean, I think we've all experienced some trauma just being human beings in a world full of, you know, crazy people. But I think my package would start uh, with me being an army brat and moving around my whole life and growing up mostly in Germany and having a very free childhood where I did basically whatever I wanted and my parents loved and supported me. I was very supported by them. They never said there's anything I couldn't do. They always stood behind me when I wanted to do something, no matter how crazy it was. Um, I think that really formed who I was, really was just moving around my whole life and being in a constant state of having to adapt to new situations and facing challenges and always being the new girl at every school I went to. Um, I know that would definitely be the major part of my story. Um, and then moving to LA and chasing my dreams and being an actress and having some success in that field, um, that would definitely be in there as well. Um, and then probably now focusing on me being in Napa in a very slow paced place where the sidewalks roll up at nine o'clock at night and, you know, I don't know. Maybe that might not be so interesting. (laughs) (laughs) And then, of course, we'd focus on my podcast and explain why I call myself a unicorn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I love that. That's a great question. Yeah. That is a great question. (laughs) Okay. Terrence has a question about the edit. So we talk a lot about the edit and, and is is, are, are what, is what we're seeing accurate or are they painting a picture of somebody? And you know a lot about this, obviously. <laughs> uh, but somebody asks, uh, outside of yourself, did you ever play with somebody who you felt like watching the show, the show distorted who they were um, and that they didn't necessarily match the person that you lived with, for good or for bad? Yeah. Yeah, Colby. <laughs> mm. Season two. Colby was, he was mean to me. And I I was very upset that they made it look like I was flirting with this guy who wanted nothing to do with me when in fact that wasn't it at all. We, him and I were both flirting with each other openly and evenly. And I would never like throw myself out there at somebody, especially on national television, who wasn't in some way reciprocating that. And it really kind of made me upset when it seemed very one-sided. So yeah, I know that happens for sure. Um, yeah. 100%. One hundred percent. Colby, that is not the answer I was expecting. Oh, what were you expecting? Yeah. I don't know. I thought you were going to say something about Boston Rob or something. Although uh, I guess you didn't really live with Boston Rob, did you? I did on Heroes and Villains. Yeah, but I think oh, of you, course, of course, you did. Yeah, but I think that season they actually showed him more true to light than he had ever been yeah. shown before. Like you really got to see yeah. how controlling he was. I mean, whenever we'd get up to go to the bathroom, he'd be like, somebody needs to go follow her. And I'd be like, trust me, you don't want to follow me right now. (laughs) I'm not doing anything that you want to see. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, uh, Brianna asks, as an iconic villain, why do you think that nobody seems to be embracing the villain persona on Survivor in the post-40 seasons? Or do, or do you think, I'm adding this on, or do you think that that's like an editing choice that Survivor is making? Um, I think that might be partially casting initially and then also the editing process. But um, I don't think they're, it doesn't seem like they're looking for a villain anymore the way they used to. Like they, mm. after Australia, they literally put in the casting notes, we're looking for the Jerry of the season. And there were people who would go into their casting sessions and be like, I'm going to be the Jerry of this season. And, you know, I don't, I don't think they're doing that anymore because they're, they're trying so hard to get uh, gentler, kindler people. I don't know. That's my theory. But I mean, honestly, I didn't go oh, okay. into it the first time. I didn't go in going, I'm going to be the villain. I just went in there like ready to kick some ass. That's all I did. That's it. I didn't try to be anything. I think that that's where yeah. most people make the misstep is they go into the casting session. Like if you get in to actually meet somebody for a casting, you shouldn't try to be anybody except yourself. And at this point in your life, if you want to be on Survivor, you shouldn't be trying anything. Just be. Just be yourself. Be unique and interesting and, and remember all the things about you that make you uniquely you and then focus on finding a way to express those things in a room with somebody who's, you know, casting survivor. Good tips. Good tips for casting. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think that, I think the show could use some more Jerry Manthes, personally. <laughs> I think we haven't had a Jerry Manthe in a while. Well, not since I was on there's it. There's not You're that right. many of you out there. You nope. Know? There's just me. <laughs> <laughs> and I could be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well we're gonna get another jerry manthe on the legend season so that's right looking forward to that yeah one of my favorite okay, things uh, to tell people I, I say never mistake my kindness for weakness and i think that that's mm. that's a very good piece of advice for anybody like me um yeah be kind but you know don't be weak <laughs> Okay, we have another one. This one's kind of fun because we don't often ask uh, former players this, but it is something people lots of, lots of people are curious about. Liz wants to know some behind-the-scenes secrets. Like, for example, what's provided that isn't discussed on the show? So I've heard that there's, like, some kind of gross sunscreen provided, <laughs> like maybe toiletries that you absolutely need. What was your experience? And you played in very different eras, like yeah. 2, 8, and 20. That, that, that's a long time apart. But what did you all have out there that wasn't shown on TV? Um, there was a medical box that was stashed in the woods. Um, for anyone that had to have certain medications, you know, they don't make you stop taking those medications. So some people had their medications. Um and there were tampons <laughs> in the medical box, which um, a lot of us used as toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> you get very inventive when you're kind of stuck out there in that situation. Um, That's adapting to a new situation. Yeah. And then after a while, um, they started putting hand sanitizer out there in that box just to try to oh. prevent infections. You know, especially with with girls, you know, it, women have a very big disadvantage in that game just because of stuff that happens every month. <laughs> yeah. Horrible. My dog is snoring. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear that? I can't hear it. It's amazing. OK, good. I'll uh, probably hear it when I'm putting the podcast. Together. Probably. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there wasn't anything beyond that that you guys don't get to see like it's very i mean it's minimal what we were given in those boxes but over the years that box did expand a little bit just to help us with infections and like you know eventually when someone scratched themselves or whatever the the medics would come out of the woods with a band-aid and some neosporin to like help you from getting an infection mm -hmm. but in australia that did not exist it was like if you cut yourself mm -hmm. and you hurt <laughs> yourself they're like Oh, well, does it hurt? Are you going to quit? Yeah. <laughs> they were very yeah. different back then. 
<laughs> but people start people did start getting taken out of the game because yeah. of cuts. Oh, because of and cuts. That's not fun to watch. People got taken out of the game because of cuts. When did that happen? Yeah. So in Micronesia, fans versus favorites. I think um, Jonathan Penner had a cut on his knee. Oh right. Um, and he got taken out. And then James had a cut on his finger, and he got taken out. Same season. Oh my gosh. And yeah. They, got, they got, had been infected. Yeah. There was that. Yeah. That's probably why they started being a little bit more diligent. Was that boring? You know, yeah, why did why did somebody go home? Oh, they got a cut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. it's not exciting. It goes two ways because people are like, "Well, Survivor's not real," and then and then you see that and you go, "Oh shit!" Yeah. But at the same time, like, we want to see the game play out. Yeah, it was no, it's very real. It that's the thing I get asked a lot actually from people yeah. like, "Are they giving you food on the side?" I'm like, "No, definitely not." <laughs> but I mean, you could tell in a lot of the seasons that I was in. We lost a lot of weight. Like, we really lost a lot of weight. These last two yeah. seasons, I know they're only 26 days, but the fact that they keep saying that they're the hardest of all the seasons, I think uh, I, I disagree on some levels when it comes to the food because I don't really see a lot of people losing weight. Yeah. I think it's all the fruit. It's a lot of sugar. <laughs> True. <laughs> It's okay, nat- nature's is candy. A... <laughs> yeah. This one is a voicemail. Okay, so I'm going to play this into the mic. So um, let me know if you can't hear it. Okay. Uh, I should give you some background on this, actually. Oh. So we have a tradition of <laughs> picking a random person from the cast and then imagining who would play them in the life of in the movie about their life. Right. Oh wow! And so in this in this season, we kind of globbed on to Lindsay as that person. We were like, "Who's going to play Lindsay in the movie of her life?" And so we we kind of landed on Laura Dern. Oh, um, I could see so, that. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. So this voicemail is going to reference this, but okay. I have a follow up question for you. Hi, Sean and Evan. This is Drew calling in from Ithaca, New York. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time sober caller. Uh, I really enjoyed last night's episode, if only so we could see more of the Coco tribe and obviously Queen Carla just kind of running circles around everyone. Um, But ultimately, what I really wanted to point out is how excited I am for the uh, ultimate Oscar-winning performance that Laura Dern will put on for this episode of the Lindsay Carmine story. Uh, I think the meltdown and the paranoia is going to be played uh, excellently. Um, Only maybe rivaled by a performance by Tony Collette. So maybe in the future. Uh, Love the pod. Keep it up, guys. Thanks. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So I hadn't even considered Laura Dern's performance of of Lindsay before this tribal council because that's going to... She's got a lot to work with. Right. But ultimately, I don't think the Lindsay story is going to be that interesting. It's short. Maybe it'll be a short. Yeah. Perhaps it'll be a so, fifteen minute. Who would play me? Did you guys ever discuss well, that? Well, that's my question. That's my question <laughs> for you, Jerry. Who plays Jerry Manthe in the story of Jerry Manthe's life? Oh my! I mean, the problem is I'm the wrong person to like. I'm bad at this. I'm I'm specifically not good at this game. So I rely on like listeners, and and Evan is really good because he just has like he can pick out any pop culture. Um, well, maybe we should I'm leave that up to, to the viewers. Yeah. Like, yeah. Where, what What do they come up with? I mean, yeah. I could... Who is playing Jerry Manthe? Yeah. I mean, like, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a dream? It doesn't have to be like a lookalike. Yeah. Cause uh, everyone, everyone always says Sarah Jessica Parker, which, mm. you know, that's a hair thing, I'm sure. And maybe some yeah. bone structure. <laughs> but I don't know if it personality wise, cause, you know, I don't know. I'd be curious what other people come up with, honestly. Yeah. It's hard to okay. do that, I think, for yourself. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> but I will think about it now. In fact, probably next week, come back with something else. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> that is if you'll have me back after this week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that's it for the voice emails. I want to ask you, I think we already talked about this, but your winner pick, your winner pick is Carla. Carla, Carla all the Amazing. way. Oh, and I love that he just called her Queen Carla. That's 
awesome. Yeah. It's got a nice a ring queen. to it. <laughs> it does. It does. It does. Hey, well, I hear the position's open in <laughs> the UK. <laughs> so, uh, okay. One more thing to note about this episode and a correction from our episode last week is that last week I said that 43 was the first season of Survivor where three women were consecutively voted out right mm. off the bat. That's not true, actually. The record is four, and we've now matched it. We have lost four women this season, uh, matched by uh, the same happened in Exile Island and Gabon. Mm. Both pretty messy seasons. So we might have something to look forward to here. <laughs> so wow. it's sad. That's uh, why, why are the women going home first? I hate that. I do too. And I, but the thing is, I didn't really even think about it that way. You know, hmm. I don't know. I think, uh, I, like I said, these, these challenges are just so physical and it seems like yeah. that's really been the deciding factor for who to get rid of is just someone who's the weakest link, um, who just happened to be women in this instance. That's why I think it would be nice if they maybe mixed up the challenges a little bit more so that they weren't all so freaking physical. Like, I, I just, I don't know. Maybe that's what's doing it. Because there's always, like, every season, there's, like, this, oh, we got to keep the strongest person around because we need to win challenges. And that, uh, that always bites people in the butt at the end when everybody's going for themselves. Um, I don't know. And I think it's the small tribes. I think it's like there's there's nowhere to hide. And so when it does come down to physical strength, it's like there's well, there's only six people here. Some of them, you know, there's only four people here. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that that really helps women in a lot of cases. And that's maybe the way that, yeah, like you say, the challenges are designed or uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, it's unfortunate to see there's five women left in the game. That's it. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. yeah, but I think we've got some good ones. And like, <laughs> I think I think Carla is long for the game. I like I would be surprised if Ellie goes anytime soon because she has been kind of a big focus over there. I think ultimately if Baca goes to tribal, I think they would rather take out Janine than Ellie. I feel like you take out uh, the person that's close to you. You weaken Ellie, right, instead of actually targeting her. Well, I actually thought she was weaker than Naka. Was it Naka? Hmm. Wait, was that? Neka. Neka. That's the tribe, right? I'm getting all confused now. No, no, no. So Baka, the yellow tribe with Ellie, who does the eyes. You who know? Um, Who did they vote off first, though? For, they voted off first Mariah, the I, rainbow hair. I thought she was stronger than Janine. To me, oh, Janine yeah. is weak. That girl is I didn't like understand that this big around. About... I'm like, yeah. what? no, if you're sticking with someone who's stronger it's it was definitely mariah and i loved her and so disappointing that they came together as a women's alliance and a woman women can do anything we stick together and then they go and vote her out yeah i loved her i loved her colorful outfit and her personality like i wanted to get to know yeah. her better that really bummed me out yeah <laughs> yeah maybe she'll be on the legend season with you jerry <laughs> i don't think, i don't think so <laughs> she went out too fast i know it's sad she did she did it makes me sad but okay <laughs> <laughs> okay let's leave it there for episode four of survivor 43 of course if you liked this episode if you want more drop your buffs you can go to our patreon and check out what we're doing there we're re-watching borneo right now uh, and recapping that on the patreon i know it's been so fun maybe we'll do australian outback and uh, have you on for an episode or oh. something that would be fun so uh, people can check that out by going to patreon.com forward slash drop your buffs um later I shouldn't say later. Soon we will be releasing an interview that we just completed with Survivor David versus Goliath's Gabby Pescuzzi. And that was a really fun interview. She told us some very funny stories about Mike White's star-studded Survivor parties that he hosted, including... <laughs> A run-in she had with Russell Hans at Jennifer Coolidge's house. So, oh my if that's God. not enough to tune in, then why wasn't I invited to that party? What the hell? I, I would love to know. <laughs> hey, why isn't Jerry Matthew the star of The White Lotus season two? <gasps> right? Oh my gosh, I love that show. I was like, I need to get Great a hold show. of him ASAP. I'm the only actual actress with like since I since I was nine years old. Come on, dude, hire me. Yeah. I would be great on that yeah. show. I love that show so much. It's so good. It's so good. 
new season out soon. Can't wait. I'm still watching season okay. one. Oh, I love it. Oh, okay. Amazing. Well, you know that somebody from David vs. Goliath is in it. He, he did <gasps> cast one of his tribe mates. Did he? Alec Merlino. Yeah, he plays like a bartender. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. I need to get a hold of him. Stat. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> if I had his number, I'd give it to you. But he doesn't, he's not, he's not on social media. He's hard to get a hold of. Let's, let's figure this out. Help me out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, make sure that you're following us on Instagram at Drop Your Buffs Pod and subscribe to this so you don't miss our upcoming episodes. And Jerry, thank you so much for joining me for this. You're so welcome. And don't forget to check out my podcast, Lessons from yes. a Floating Unicorn with Jerry Manthe. Subscribe, <laughs> rate, review. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, Jerry, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Sean. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody.